I'm Grady Booch, an IBM Fellow and Chief Scientist for Software Engineering and IBM Research. My job is to help invent the future, and as an engineer, I do so by challenging the limits of science, math, and technology. In my office in Colorado, I have a reproduction of a clock originally built in the 1300s. Today we keep time by measuring the energy emitted by an atom, but in its day, this mechanical clock was a breakthrough in technology. Now, that clock didn't simply spring into being, but rather it was the product of engineering skill coupled with scientific experimentation, work that was made manifest by hundreds if not thousands of men and women over the years before. From time to time I work in another office, in a place called Thornbridge. But Thornbridge is not a place you'll find on any map, for it's made entirely of ones and zeros. Thornbridge is a parcel on an IBM island in a virtual world called Second Life. In Second Life, I exist as an avatar that looks very much like me in real life. Here I can meet and work with colleagues, give lectures, solve problems with people around the world, but without having to leave the comfort of my physical office in Colorado. In my physical office, I am surrounded by computers that are the product of the many scientists and engineers whose innovations led to the production of the transistor, the integrated circuit, the magnetic disk, the algorithms, programming languages, and applications that I use to do my work as a software architect. Each of these devices, the clock and the computers, hide a fierce complexity. Inside the clock were dozens of gears that pushed the limits of manufacturing in the 1300s, and inside this computer are millions of transistors and billions upon billions of bits of storage that equally push the limits of what we can do. From the outside, these software-intensive devices appear simple, but inside, complexity abounds. From the three-dimensional structure of an integrated circuit, where we can construct transistors from only a few hundred or so atoms, to the tightly integrated parts of a mobile phone, to the millions of lines of software that direct our computers, to the large-scale structure of the web itself. There's a similar sort of complexity at the highest scale of our universe, from the structure of galaxies that are millions of light years away, to the intricate mechanisms that contribute to the life of a cell, to the patterns that we can only now begin to see at the level of an atom. Scientists advance our understanding of the world by conducting verifiable experiments that build upon one another, and in so doing try to bring light to the profound and elegant simplicity that underlies the complexity in the stars, the living organisms, even the subatomic. Engineers, on the other hand, draw from this science to craft useful artifacts such as cars and phones and buildings and computers and cities, as well as new drugs or smart cities or robotic assistants. In a way, these engineers take the simple, use their sense of innovation and their ability to problem solve to weave the simple together in some very clever and complex ways, and then deliver up useful artifacts that enhance our lives. Scientists work to find the simple and the complex, while engineers are creative problem solvers that help shape the future by presenting up the illusion of simplicity through the intricately complex objects they produce. Now, I'm a different sort of engineer, namely a software engineer, and that means I don't build things out of wood or stone or even silicon, but rather out of pure thought, which gets written down in a programming language and controls the action of the computing device. As Bjarne Strustrup, the inventor of the C++ programming language, has once said, our civilization runs on software. And so what I and my colleagues do is not only tremendously fun, it's important work. As engineers, we take and develop visions of what might be, and then labor to turn those visions into reality. In fact, what I find exciting about engineering software-intensive systems is that virtually all technology, including this very video you are watching, is at the core just the visible dance of trillions and trillions of ones and zeros. Every time you listen to some music on your iPod, remember that there's some digital stuff below the surface. When you look at a video or a static image on the web, you are looking at ones and zeros that have been stored and transmitted according to a specifically engineered protocol. When you text with your friends or make a phone call, you're interacting with software. Software-intensive systems aren't just about artifacts that entertain us, of course, but they also attend to the running of major things such as electrical gear grids or stock markets or transportation systems. We use software-intensive systems to care for the health of individuals. And we use software-intensive systems to push the limits of science, be it by setting the paths of the human genome around the world to exploring the limits of what it means to be sentient. 
Engineers make a world of difference, for they work to invent the future of the world. No matter what kind of a future you or anyone else might envision, it will require the inventiveness and labor of men and women who know how to solve problems, weaving together scientific knowledge with technological skill, all tempered by moral and ethical concerns that responsibly bring those visions to reality. It is both a privilege and a responsibility for me as an engineer to help invent that future. Do you want to change the world? Do you want to improve people's lives? Then prepare now. Develop your knowledge and your creativity and your thirst for curiosity in school. Challenge yourself. Develop a sound foundation in math, science, and good writing and communication skills so that you can form and articulate your unique vision, a vision that no one else might see. And most importantly, have fun. That's the fuel for your imagination that will bring your ideas to life to help change the world.